Professor, welcome. I'm Professor very... Leon Cooper, welcome to Linda. Uh, it's very nice to have you here. Um, I'm very happy be... to be here. Thanks. Nice, nice, cool weather you have. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's the fifth time that you are visiting Linda and this very particular meeting where scientists and young scientific students meet. What is it that uh, makes it you coming back for the fifth time? Uh, actually, I didn't remember that it was the fifth time. Each time is, is different. Uh, the, this time in particular, I'm interested because it's a meeting of medicine, doctors and physiologists, and I'm a theoretical physicist that has been working in the areas of neuroscience, and basically I'm on a mission to convince the medical and the, uh, the physiologists that uh, a theoretical physicist can make a contribution to their field. Basically, I, actually, to be more direct, uh, theory has played an enormously important role in physics, and physicists understand the interaction between theory and experiment, but this is relatively new in neuroscience, and uh, what I would like to do is to present an example of how theory can be useful in neuroscience. And we have lots, I think we have very convincing case, but we'll wait to see what the experts say. That's part of your uh, talk tomorrow, I believe. Uh, well, that is probably is my talk tomorrow. Yes, I guess I, what, I, what I would like to show is how a theoretical structure can lead to new experiments that discover new phenomena that eventually can be of use. Uh, well, you know, we never can be totally sure of what the usefulness will be in advance. It's one of the mistakes people make about science. Scientists are really no better at predicting the usefulness or lack of usefulness of what we do than anyone else, because basically none of us can predict the future. However, uh, statistically, the, the uses are enormous. If we just return the clock a little bit and look backwards to what you achieved when you were about 28, 27 years old, could you have imagined what you then found out, what use it have had at that time? Well, that's the that's a, that's a good question because uh, we were interviewed over and over in the, toward the end of the 50s, and the first question was, well, what are the practical applications of this uh, this great theoretical breakthrough? And uh, we listed all kinds of things like uh, uh, superconducting power lines and things of that kind, and some of them are actually coming to pass. You know, it's 50 years later, but the most important by far is what's called a superconducting quantum interference device based on what is known as the Josephson effect, uh, which we didn't even, we didn't know it existed at the time. And that came just a few years later, and that's now, uh, you know, it's, it's a way of measuring magnetic fields that's far more sensitive, and it's just used everywhere. I mean, it's used in all kinds of devices, all kinds of electronic devices. And you see, that's the amusing thing. Uh, it was a consequence of our theory, but it wasn't one that we, I, you know, I wish I had foreseen it, but then I sometimes kick myself for not having foreseen it, but we didn't, at least I didn't. And uh, it's typical of what happens in scientific discovery, that you don't necessarily foresee all of the consequences of what you yourself have done. And a very practical use, for example, there is an electrical train, I believe, grown on man magnetics. Yeah, that was, that, was, uh, that was the kind of thing that we thought of. But uh, so far, that hasn't been done. I mean, that's the, uh, th that would be regarded as kind of an obvious application. This was a much more subtle application, and uh, it we just hadn't been thought of. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I could give you many examples. Uh, for example, the famous n nuclear physicist Rutherford, uh, in the twenties, was reported to have said that the idea that you could get energy out of the nucleus was moonshine, mm -hmm. and he was probably the greatest nuclear physicist alive at that time. The studies that so it makes, it makes one humble, humble. Yeah, is it, is it important to be humble as a scientist? Mm, I wouldn't say that, we're all pretty arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> but in light of, of, you know, what application that you couldn't think of, and that's, that's coming up through. Well, I suppose it would be prudent, uh, but that doesn't mean that most people are. Uh, and, uh, oh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure, you, you, you certainly should be cognizant of the fact that you can't predict the future. It's very hard to predict the future. And often there are just unexpected things that happen that we don't foresee. 
And so, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons that when you do work, that you to, you, you, when you do scientific work, uh, and a current example is stem cell research, which, you know, is enormously controversial. And we have politicians saying that you should do this, you should do that, you can get the best, better results doing this, or as good doing that. And, I mean, how, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. I mean, the experts don't know. The only thing you can really say is that nobody knows exactly which, what the fruitful paths will be, or if there will be a fruitful path. And so, basically, what scientists do is to try everything and see what happens. I reasonably convinced that there will be success in some direction or, no, or another, but I, I don't think anyone could predict at the moment. That's another, I'm sorry, I, obviously I don't give you any chance because once I get going, I talk. That's one of the reasons that it's very dangerous to constrain research from above. Administrative agencies that try to say do this and don't do that and don't do the other thing, they can't predict any, any better than the scientists can. It's just very dangerous. So you, what you really should do, in my opinion, in large part, is you should put your money on your best racehorses and then let them run the race they think is best. And, uh, it's not perfection, but probably will work better than anything else. The work that you're doing at the moment to see the way the mind works, as, as to simplify it, um, what is the... You want to have a talk tomorrow to... Yeah, or an omission, you say, but what can you see in the future? What uses can this have? Oh, well, there, I mean, the uses are, uh, well, first of all, there are an enormous number of mental diseases of all kinds, everything from mood diseases to schizophrenia to all kinds of things. And hopefully, if you understand how the system works, you would be able to do something about uh, repairing some of those problems. And I have a personal opinion that many of the worst problems might be a little easier than people expect because it's so easy to alter moods. And then we, we, have, so we have various conceptual reasons for believing that things like memory consolidation and mood are influenced by overall factors. And so uh, you could make therapeutic interventions. I mean, we don't know, of course, if they, how effective they will be or whether they will work. You, you would never know before you actually do it. But there's every reason to believe that you would have, you could have substantial uh, uh, help in various mental diseases. And then, of course, there's the intellectual challenge of seeing how a biological system, how neurons put themselves together to process information and to eventually mental, how we achieve our mental states and so on. It's an enormous intellectual challenge. And you don't really know what the consequences are, but we can say from a past history that there will be consequences, we can't foresee them all, and the chances are some of them will be of immense importance. It obviously still gives you a lot of satisfaction to do this work. What are the biggest challenge, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis? Mm, getting out of bed in the morning. <laughs> 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 get, get, getting, getting enough caffeine into you so your mind starts functioning. But interaction with other students, I scientists, how do you see how on that level? Is, is that a challenge to build teams? To uh... It's something I enjoy very much. I really, really enjoy. Uh, I don't subconsciously so build teams. They evolve. And I just work with uh, different groups of associates and students on different problems. And some of them are seemingly very profound, and others are relatively straightforward. For example, I'm enormously pleased that we've just invented a new way to build a sonar system that is much, it seems to be an enormous improvement over current systems. And uh, it's not really my field, but it's just, I'm, I just, I love problems of that kind. I love, uh, once, once I get into them, I'm very, very interested, and I don't, I don't think you can really work by feeling I am ch I've chosen a, a problem that's enormously important or that you you sort of are led from one thing to the other and uh, of course you try to work on things that will make a difference that have significance you don't want to waste a lot of time on things but still you're led sometimes in unexpected directions and something that you wouldn't have thought would be interesting suddenly becomes intriguing mm -hmm. I mean, just, uh, you see, it's just, it's just intriguing. You want to solve it. Basically, you know, many scientists, like I've been characterized as a problem solver. I get fascinated by a problem, and I want to solve it. 
and uh, uh, it's a challenge. It's it's uh, it's not so much a challenge. It's really it's it's an enormous pleasure to work on a problem, to work on it with people, and then to feel your way through it. It's the same pleasure I think as probably doing crossword puzzle or something. Do you think that the, the prize gave you a better opportunity to do your work, the Nobel Prize back in 1972? Well, sure, it gives, you, it gives you an opportunity to, uh, gives you additional opportunities to get financing, to get people to make foolish statements. I mean, so people are always asking you to express your opinions about things you don't know anything about. <laughs> you have to be a little careful. But sure, of course it gives you opportunities. and. Uh, I think used properly, carefully, it's a tremendous advantage, a tremendous advantage. Also, it's, uh, it's somewhat of a burden because in the sense that people uh, look at what you do differently, they judge it differently, there's always the question of what are you going to do next. And if you worry about that, you just can't do anything. And basically, you just do next. You just, you do next what, what is next. And you don't worry about it too much. I mean, you don't, not every problem you work on is of Nobel Prize caliber. That's all. It would be, be ridiculous to even think that way. Sometimes it evolves, sometimes it doesn't. I, I believe that um, you have also, for example, spoken out on political issues. I have seen letters uh, that you have signed, for example, in the problems back in the 80s in Poland and so on. Um, do um, the Nobel Prize winners have a special responsibility, do you think, as well, in, in certain fields? Well, I think uh, I have a responsibility, just as every other citizen, to express myself on issues if I feel I have any competence or have, a, have an opinion. And uh, I don't do it too often, but I sometimes do. And if having the Nobel Prize helps, then, uh, then, then that's fine. But... Uh, Sure. I, uh, although, but you do, again, you have to be careful because you can easily abuse the privilege and find yourself, you're asked, I mean, I'm asked to sign things on things I know nothing about whatsoever. And I, I try to avoid that. Do you think the climate for scientific studies and for scientists in general is better in the United States than in Europe? There were some talks about that today, briefly mentioned. Uh, it has been, well, I think probably it has its ups and downs, but for many years it was, uh, it was very good in the United States. I think Europe is coming up in certain fields. It's a question, it's a question of support, the openness of universities, the freedom to do research, uh, the a absence of stifling uh, influences from above. And I think the United States in, has been freer in that respect. But, you know, we have our bad periods, too. It's, uh, and we always have, they're always, you see, there are always politicians. You see, people who are the same. There are always politicians. There are always people who, want, who will stifle research by saying you should do one thing and not do another. But it's just harder to do in the United States because in the United States there's so many centers of power that uh, it's a little more difficult, but still, the agencies in the United States that provide the money for research have enormous influence, and they can, they can be stifled by the Congress. Congress, oh, Congress is often trying to do that. most recent example is stem cell research. Yeah. But they're always the part, you know, talk about, talk about arrogance. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean you have, you have uh, politicians with literally telling scientists uh, what the best way to do their research is, which is uh, something even more than ludicrous, wouldn't you say? What would your advice be then to a young scientific student who would listen into this interview eventually on the internet? Well, I think that uh, any, any person who is interested in science and is willing to, to, to work and to have the discipline should do it and should do well, well, advice in one respect should they go into science or should they what country should they go to or? well i mean if you have this kind of from above and lack of money situation control i mean do, it's not only that you maybe have to do your scientific studies you also have to take another fight well it's not that bad i mean it's uh it 
uh, the situation, I think what would be more accurate is to say that the situation has its ups and downs, like most of history, and some periods are a little better, some periods are a little worse. You know, it's just like the general economic environment. There are some, uh, some areas in science become hot, and if you get your PhD there, I mean, you have a hundred jobs waiting for you. In other areas, you can't find a job. And five years later, it's just the reverse. It's, I mean, it's somewhat, somewhat aggravating, but uh, it's not that different from the economics of the entire community. But I think the, uh, the main thing is that I think there are enormous opportunities in science. And for people who uh, can do it and are willing to do the work, there's almost always something. But again, there may be some fields that suddenly become overpopulated and some areas that suddenly become less fashionable. It's, it's, it's unfortunate because it takes a, it's a long time commitment to become a scientist and you may go into an area that is not fashionable by the time you get out of it. But I don't know what to advise about that. If I were, as far as national policy is concerned, my own feeling is that it should be kept on a steady course and not go back and forth with fashions. But uh, the politicians don't listen to that either, so. We are coming to the end of the interview. Um, what is maybe your greatest memory from, from your time as a scientist? Is there one particular memory that you would like to share with us? Uh, I suppose my greatest memories are working together on some of the major problems that I've solved with other people and realizing that I had the solution. It was, just, it was simply enormously exciting. But, you know, I might, I might almost say that some of the greatest pleasure I've had are in smaller problems that no one has ever heard of. That was just so exciting to uh, the, uh, the thrill. It's the, the thrill of having uh, uh, just uh, mastered them. But, I suppose the, the quick answer is I can't come up with something that sounds like <laughs> the major, major memory to me. Do people, when you ask that question, do people immediately have a memory? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That could be, I mean, it could be anything. It could also be a very long working night in the, in the lab. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, I see. I see. Some things, as you said, is well, I remember problem. once. I remember once uh, when we were working on the theory of superconductivity that we were absolutely baffled by one particular problem. And I, I had this very complex calculation in my head, so I just could do it over and over again in my head. And I was at a concert in the University of Illinois by a musician who was the brother of Virgil Parch, who was a cartoonist, Harry Parch. I, I won't go through all that. Anyhow, in the middle of the concert, I, I saw that there was a whole thing that I had left out. And the way it was is that it was another term that was equal to the term that we understood. But I couldn't work out the sign, because there were about five sign changes. I didn't know if it was plus or minus. If it was plus, then we would have exactly the right number. And if it was minus, the entire effect would disappear. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I just could not do, get the sign. The sign is a very hard thing, because it changes. And I, I remember going home and going over it and over it and over it and over it. And yes, it was right. It came out. It was perfect. So that was a good memory. <laughs> As I called it, that's really playing roulette with the family fortune, Dub <laughs> double or nothing. <laughs> so you were or, happy then to announce it to your wife? Or <laughs> uh, Did you? It was, yes, but mostly to my colleagues. Oh. And, uh, so anyhow. Thank you, Professor Cooper. You're welcome. And uh, okay. have a very good stay here in Lindau. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you.